in this video, I'm going to review in this video, I'm going to provide a quick overview of how to use evidently AI for your data science projects. And so without further ado, we're starting right now. So prior to filming this video, I've heard about Evidently AI on Twitter and also on LinkedIn. And so in this video, I'm going to provide you a very quick overview and I'm going to show you how I would approach using a new library. And so let's have a look together and I'll talk about my thought process of how I adapt a new library into my existing data sets. And so Let's have a look at the website. So this is the website of Evidently AI and you could head over to evidentlyai.com. And so let's have a look here. So here, the first feature that you see is that it'll provide you some metrics that will allow you to look at the model performance. And a unique part of this is that it allows you to have a look at the drift of the data and it'll signify which features are drifting. And here it will allow you to visually have a look at the target drift. And if you have a look further, there's also a visualization that will allow you to also perform like a quick EDA. So for one thing, any data set that you're working with, there's a high probability that you're going to have some missing data. And so evidently AI provides a very quick approach for you to have a look at the missing data. And so here the red boxes will represent the missing data. However, it should be noted that this feature for data integrity will be available soon. Same for feature analysis. So you could also have a look at the change in the correlation of some features over time. And another feature that will be available in the future would be the performance by segment. So for this one, you could stratify the data set and then you could look at the various statistical metrics as a function of the stratified data. Like for example, here they mentioned about the data regions. So for example, if you have a classification data set where you're classifying the iris flowers, so it will allow you to segment or stratify amongst the different types of flower. So for each of the three different types of flower, you will be able to look at the various statistical metrics. And scroll further here. So this provides a very quick overview of evidently AI. So here it mentions that you would only have to import evidently.dashboard and also import evidently.tabs into your Jupyter Notebook. And then the thing is you'll prepare your data as a data frame using pandas. And then the rest from there, you're going to use evidently AI. And here it mentions that at the end of your analysis, you'll be able to generate a report, which you could share with your team and for this one, it will be available soon. So you could run it as a service. So probably they're going to make it into like a dashboard, a portable version, like a web application, probably similar to that of Gradio or Streamlit. And to get started, you only need to pip install evidently. And so why don't I have a look at the documentation? Let's click here. So let's figure out together how I'll use Evidently AI on an existing data set that I normally use. So let's have a look here. What is it? It allows you to evaluate and monitor machine learning models in production, and it will generate interactive reports or JSON profile from your pandas data frame or CSV files. And so here it mentions that it will generate six types of reports. And currently it supports tabular data. And so the first type of report is the data drift report. And you notice here that there's a link. So if you click on the link, you're going to have more details about it. And so the documentation of Evidently AI is very nice and it's very complete as well. So here they provide the TLDR uh, they provide the summary, it provides the requirements here and how does it work. And it provides you a glimpse of how does it look like for the data drift table. And so here you could have a look at the distribution of the data for your reference data and also for the current data and whether there is data drift detected or not and the p-value. And another way of visualizing such data drift by the features here is to have a look here. And they'll also provide you data distribution by feature. 
and so you have the reference data in gray and the current data in red. Okay, so it's very detailed, right? So this is for the first report, data drift. And the second report is the numerical target drift. So let's have a look here. It detects changes in numerical target and the feature behavior. So these are some nice visualization generated by the reports. Let's have a look at the third type of the report and it is the categorical target drift. So here it provides a detection of changes in the categorical target and the feature behavior. Let's have a look at this. So this is the example image generated by the reports. So here you see the reference in the left panel here. And for the right panel, you see the visualization for the current data set. So the target drift, does it occur when it is comparing the reference data versus the current data? Okay, so they segment the data and then they show you two separate visualization in order to allow you to see whether there is a data drift occurring or not. All right, and so the fourth report is the regression model performance. And the fifth report is for the classification model performance. So here they take the error and they show you the distribution in histogram for the reference data and also for the current data. And so you'll be able to see the spread of the data for both. And then they're gonna see that it exhibits different behavior. Okay, so this provides a very useful diagnostic of the model and the classification model as well. So you compare the reference with the current data in order to see whether there is a correlational difference that arises from the data drift. And how about number six? The report is for probabilistic classification model performance. So here you're taking a classification model. So typically the values here are generated by scikit-learn and it's coming from the function predict proba. And so it's the prediction probability. And so you could use those probability to visualize here. So they compare again, the reference data and the current data. And so you can see that the reference data, there is a clear separation between the malignant and the other. Whereas for the current data here, the distribution is not so distinct. Okay, so they're starting to have some overlapping regions at the middle here. All right, so these are the six type of reports. And they even provide some example Jupyter Notebook and tutorials. Let's have a look at the notebook here. All right, very nice. It provides a very detailed explanation on how you could prepare your data as a pandas data frame and so here they essentially stratified the data into two portions so the first is the reference right and then the second will serve as the current data set so essentially they're comparing here is two data frame okay so the current data frame and the reference data frame so reference data frame could be a data frame for the model that you have already built. And let's say that over time, a year afterward, that would then become the current data. Okay, so you would want to see whether your model, which you have built last year, is this still applicable or is this still valid for the future data, the current data? Okay, so they use the reference data set and the current data set, and then they use both for comparison. And so Apparently, evidently, AI will perform all of this automatically here using the functions provided in the notebook. And so whichever you would like to implement, you could click on the link and you go to the report description here. And they also provide you some Jupyter Notebook as well. Right, let's scroll and have a look at some of the functions here, generating the reports. Okay, so actually we could follow this step by step. So the first step here would be to prepare the data as a pandas data frame. And let's see, all column names are string, all feature names that are analyzed for drift have numerical type. Okay. Pass the column mapping into dashboard. Okay. So it is for mapping the properties of the columns. Okay, so essentially they're creating a dictionary, an empty dictionary. And then here, line by line, you're going to populate the dictionary. So the first key would be target, and then the following value would be Y. 
So this is the name of the column, which will serve as the target. And so the prediction here is the name of the column with the model prediction. So your predictions will go here into the prediction. And then ID is the ID of the data set. Date time is the name of the column with date time. Okay, so if your data set has date time, meaning your data set is a time series data set, then you would have this column numerical features and categorical features. Okay, so here you specify which of your columns are numerical and which of your columns are categorical. Okay, so if you have categorical features and you're encoding them, you would also specify it here. Okay, so, and then it provides you some detail of generating the reports. All right, so why don't we fire up a Jupyter Notebook. So here it apparently saves to import dashboard and tabs. So let me see. Let me see. Let's see. I'll open up the examples here as well. So why don't I choose the regression performance here. I'll click the bike sharing link. And so here is the Jupyter Notebook of it. All right. So let me have a look briefly at the notebook here. So here they're importing all of the libraries. So they have pandas, numpy, they have the random forest from scikit-learn, and then they import specific functions from evidently. All right. So here they'll read in the data sets and then they'll segment the data into the reference data and the production data. So the current data, right? All right. So they just have like the first 120 rows to be reference data and then the last few rows to be the production data. And then they specify the target to be C and T. And then they specify the numerical features and the categorical features. And then for the features, they have the numerical and the categorical combined. And then they built the model, made the prediction all right, and then they generated the reports. Okay, cool. So why don't I simply just, instead of creating a new one here, I'll copy this link and let's see, I'll open up a new one. Open notebook. I'll go to GitHub and I'll paste the link. Okay. And I'll click on the bike sharing one, right? Which is the link that I copied. Okay. So I'll modify this. Okay. Okay. So here is going to be the solubility data. So I just say load, load data. Okay. And so raw data here, I'll put in the link of the data set. I'll also rename the, okay. So let me save it into my Google drive. So it's creating a copy. All right, so let me close that one then. So here, the link I'll put in, I'll delete the other ones. Okay, so I'll read it in as raw data. Let's see how many, okay, so I'll import pandas as PD first. Oh, okay, so I'll have to install evidently first. So pip install evidently. So I don't think I'm using NumPy. So I'll delete it and then I'll run it. Okay, and then let's load the data. And then let's have a look at the shape of the data. Shape. So I have 1,144. So let's say if I do a 80-20 split, how many would that be? So I'll do 1144 multiply 0 0.8. So it's going to be 915. Okay. So why don't I do this? 915 here. 915 until the last one. Okay. And so let's have a look at the ref data shape and the prod data shape. Okay. So now I have 915 rows for the ref data and I'll have 228 rows for the production data. Okay, so roughly 80, 20. And so let's have a look at the ref data here. So apparently all of them are numerical. 
So let's see for the target it's going to be the log s. So I'll change that to log s. Date time I don't have it. I'll just comment it. Okay, so categorical features I don't have, so I'll delete that from here. And numerical features, so we have, so why don't I, let me see. So this is ref data. So if I do columns, what do I get? And if I do list, okay, cool. And, but I will not, okay, so why don't I do this? Let me drop. I'll draw block S. Let's see what do I get. Okay, so I have to add an axis equals to one. Okay, there you go. So what I did just now is I take the ref data data frame, and I I drop log S, which is the last column. So then I have only the X variables, and then I use axis equals to one to specify that I'm dropping the column. So if axis equals to zero, then it means that I'm working with the rows. But then because it's column, I use axis equals to one. And then dot columns here will display the names of the columns right here. And then I'll make it into a list so that it will resemble a list here. So I'll put that in here. And I have my numerical features. Right, and so we'll build a random forest model. Okay, and here we use a random state of zero and we'll assign it to the model variable. Let's do that. And then we'll build the model using the model.fit function. So we specify the X and the Y. So X are the features and Y are the target. So the model is built and then we'll perform the prediction using model.predict and then the input data is the X for the reference, which is like the training set and production, which is like the test set. And then we assign it to the ref data in a new column called prediction. And we'll do the same for the production data. So we'll assign it to a new column called prediction as well. We'll run it. Okay, so let's have a look at the data set again. I mean, the data frame with a new column prediction. So it's right here, prediction side by side. Okay, and the production data, let's have a look. Prod data. And the prediction is right here to the right. Okay, and let's see. Regression, performance, reports, column mapping. Target is target, prediction, prediction. Date time, we don't have it, so I'll comment that out. Numerical features, yeah, we have that. Um, categorical features, we don't have that. I'll comment that out. Okay, let's run it. The column mapping. And then let's create the dashboard. All right. Let's see. I think they left the space here. So let's run it. So it's creating the dashboard. And let's see. In a moment, we probably will see it here. Dashboard.show loading. Okay. So if it's not showing, then I'll generate the report then. So probably we'll have to activate some options in the Jupyter Notebook to make it work. But to save time, we'll just proceed here. So let's save it out as a report. So I'll call it solubility.html. And so it should be in the file pane here. Here, solubility. Let me double click. Let's see. So it's taking a long time. Oh, okay, so it shows me the HTML. So why don't I download it and then I'll open it up for you. Okay, and it's loaded right here. I'll click on it, solubility. All right, so this is the report. So for the reference data and the current data. So let's see, mean error, this is zero, this is minus 0 0.02. Mean absolute error, 0 0.21. And the current is 0 0.59, okay? And so the reference data is shown here and the current data is shown here. So we'll look at the predicted versus actual. Okay, so roughly it looks quite similar. Reference error, okay. And it's performing some diagnostic measures here. And so roughly the error distribution are the same, pretty much. This is more smooth because of more data here. And the normality is roughly normal. Okay, so you will see that both are not really drifting. And you might see that the variance is a bit loose here because 
there's fewer data, right? Because we have 80% here and 20% here. All right, let's have a look at the error bias. Okay, so they're showing for each features and then you're going to see the reference and the current data. Okay, so they're showing for each of the features. So you could compare 2.42 is the majority and it's 2.17 for the majority of the current. So here have the majority and they have the overestimation shown in red and the underestimation shown in blue. And the majority is shown in green. Okay, so they are the predictions under or over the general trend line. Okay, so pretty nice here. It allows you to quickly compare the two data sets. And because we're drawing them from the same data set, it really looks the same. And so they don't really have a data drift, but it would be interesting to actually use that on an actual data where over time, something might have changed. Maybe the buffer, I mean, the reagent that are used for the experiment might change. Maybe they changed the brand. And so that might also influence the measured property. And so that would be an interesting way to observe such changes over time. And so let me know in the comments down below how you found this Evidently AI library. And if you're finding value in this video, please smash the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and also hit on the notification bell to be notified of the next video. And as always, the best way to learn data science is to do data science. And please enjoy the journey.